I want to send a special congratulations to all of you college football fans who survived the first half of the college football preseason. The half where it's cold weather, where spring games and spring practices are all that matters, where the transfer portal is wide open so you don't know who is going to stay or leave your roster, recruiting is a big thing, there's even some coaching movement still into the spring at times, and it's just a very stressful part of the preseason. But half of it's done, a lot of the stress is done and over with, with rare exception the transfer portal is done. I'm 99% confident that there will be no coaching changes made from here on out, unless it's a big surprise, or a scandal, or a health condition, similarly to the portal. The open portal window has closed. Now we're just waiting for summer practice and workouts. And most importantly, we're waiting for the first college football games to kick off. That's what we're waiting for. In the meantime, we will all have to endure phase two of the preseason. And phase two, while not as painful as phase one, because you're much closer to the regular season beginning, I would argue phase two has a side to it that is more toxic than phase one. Phase two contains media cancer. It contains people who think that based off of spring games, spring practices, that they have everything figured out. And that they know who the the sleepers and risers are going to be in the realm of college football. And the reality is, whether it's me or whether it's anyone else, we don't know. It's just the preseason. And the media toxicity can take itself in multiple forms. Multiple forms. But the biggest form that it takes itself in is scrutinizing or overly criticizing programs who who are just great and who are elite and they haven't proven otherwise, and putting programs inside the top 10 or inside the top four that don't make sense. They're making quote-unquote dark horse predictions, but in reality, if everyone are, is making those dark horse predictions, it's not unique. An example of this is putting Florida State in the top four which I frankly think is lunacy. Another example of this is putting Ohio State outside of the top four, which is what we are going to be talking about today. If you're a Buckeye fan, if you're a college football fan, and if you follow ESPN, and I I do, and I think everyone ought to, whether it produces great content or garbage content, which it does both, but ESPN updated its top 25. The spring edition of its top 25 is fascinating. There are many new faces in here. Georgia's at number one. They were one of the few teams who remained at their exact spot. Number one. Michigan's at number two. They moved up from number three. Florida State's at three. They moved up from number four. And I may not have stated earlier that I thought Florida State inside the top four is lunacy, but the more research I do about Florida State, And the more I realize that the ACC is like two, it's like two whole buildings, like two of the world's tallest buildings under every other Power Five conference. It's extremely weak. It's it's more top heavy than even the Pac-12 is, and at least the Pac-12 has five or six quality teams, whereas the ACC maybe has four at best in Clemson, Florida State, maybe Pittsburgh, maybe NC State, maybe, maybe North Carolina, if Mac Brown can get himself and his defense figured out. But the more research I do into Florida State, I just want to shoot it out there. I don't like them as a top four pick. They don't have enough skill position talent. It's the inverse of Ohio State, really. Florida State's pretty sure on defense, while Ohio State has some question marks there, but Ohio State's loaded at every possible skill position you can imagine. Florida State, outside of quarterback, is basically barren at the skill position, which is why if they can land Keon Coleman, that would be very impressive, but I don't know if they'll be able to do that. Notre Dame, Michigan, 
Ole Miss. I already mentioned Florida State, but I'll mention them again. And many others have reached out to Keon Coleman. I personally wouldn't mind if my Wolverines got him. And Ohio State is going to be one of the few schools that won't even bother reaching out to him because of how deep their wide receiver core is. Which is why it's asinine that USC's at four and Ohio State's at five. They dropped from two to five. And let's look at ESPN's reasoning behind this. The post-spring outlook. Junior Kyle McCord took the first step in taking over the reins from C.J. Stroud with a solid performance in the spring. Sophomore Devin Brown, another contender, missed the spring game with a finger injury. Coach Ryan Day won't name a starting quarterback until preseason camp. Buckeyes are loaded at running back and receiver. Carnell Tate, a freshman from IMG Academy, was a star in the spring, but the offensive line remains a work in progress. Senior Josh Fryer was the number one left tackle in the spring. Sophomore Tedra Teshebola was working on the right. Correct me if I mispronounced that name. After ugly performances and losses to Michigan and Georgia last season, the Georgia loss was not ugly. The defense seemed to make some much-needed strides in the spring. Safety Cameron Martinez might help shore up a leaky secondary. Jack Sawyer and JT Tui Molau are going to be stars up front. I still need an explanation outside of wanting to be right without much evidence as to why Ohio State is worse than USC and Florida State. When Ohio State has infinitely more talent, when Ryan Day at worst is just another edition of Lincoln Riley, who's a great offensive mind but can't coach a defense, like at worst, at worst, him and Lincoln Riley are basically the same thing. Ryan Day's actually won a college football playoff game. And Mike Norvell, I understand why people are high on him. I think he's a good coach. But it is only, I think, year four. Putting them inside the top four is kind of comparing them to maybe 2015 Clemson. I don't think they're there yet. So I need an explanation for that. It is officially, and part of me cringes at saying this as a Michigan fan, it's officially Ohio State against the world. Now, There are reasons to have Ohio State outside of the top four. There are reasons to be low on them. There are some good reasons. But instead of naming Ohio State's offensive line and calling it for what it is, which is elite in the center, but very questionable at tackle, they box it up as if the whole offensive line has issues. The interior is perfect. I don't think... I don't think anyone could really argue with that. Now, tackle's a big problem. Now, also, what you know hasn't, what isn't even discussed in the post-spring outlook, is running back health. Like running back health is a tremendous reason. If if it's if Ohio State's going to be outside your top four, that could be that would be one of the more valid reasons because last year, if Ohio State has a healthy backfield, or they have a healthy wide receiver in Jackson Smith and Jigba. They probably go 13-1, and one, only lose to Michigan, win the national title. Or maybe they beat Michigan but lose in the playoff. I-, I don't know. Health and strength and conditioning were a big concern for Ohio State last year. It's not even listed up here by ESPN. Not even listed up here. So is Ohio State declining? Like, that's a legitimate question. It's a question that ESPN poses. It's a question that an article that was written yesterday poses that I am going to read regarding Ryan Day. And I'm going to read it briefly. Um, but the title, and I'll link it down below, is Biggest Concern, Ryan Day Has Peaked as Ohio State Head Coach. During his four years as Buckeye Head Coach, Day has lost to Michigan twice and failed to win the college football playoff in three appearances. Yeah. Well, during Kirby Smart's first four years, he only made the playoff once, and it took him a while to figure out some stuff, but he got rolling. And I was one of the people who mistakenly made the question as to whether Kirby Smart peaked or not. I'm not making that mistake again. Four years, while you get to see the product on the field, and at four or five years, it's safe to assume that, like, this is what you get. There is room for change, and there is room for adaptation. It's rare, but coaches learn. 
just like how we learn in our daily lives. So we're going to read that article. But before that, I want to pose three points. Are the Buckeyes declining? Here are some three reasons why I think that could be rationalized. Ohio State clearly has problems at tackle, and they have to replace Luke Whippler, who was drafted by the Browns. I don't think replacing center, while center is very important, it is a big deal. I think Jacob James at center is going to be much less of a question mark than Josh Fryer and he who starts opposite of him at tackle, whose name I've already briefly forgotten. But I think that you can see that Ohio State, who's already a pass team, they have been a pass team under Day, and they're a spread team, they haven't been traditionally known necessarily as a power team or as a team that likes to pound it up the middle. Though part of me thinks that that will change this year as the team is more equipped to do that on the offensive line. But there is a question at tackle. There's a very big question. It did not look good in the spring game where I think Ohio State surrendered five sacks on on offense. And they had several surrendered tackles for loss, much of which was due to tackle and outside runs. Another reason is Kyle McCord and Devin Brown are still competing for the starting quarterback role. Both are inexperienced. Kyle McCord only has one start. And if I'm being honest, and I and practically everyone else said this about C.J. Stroud early in 2021 when comparing him to Justin Fields, and we were wrong, but you never know, so I'm going to throw the comparison out there. He doesn't look like C.J. Stroud or Justin Fields. And like like with any new starting quarterback, there is risk there. There is a chance that Kyle McCord does what every other Ohio State quarterback does. There's also a chance that maybe because of his five-star ranking, C.J. Stroud was only a four-star, that he is Ohio State's best passing quarterback in the Ryan Day era. There's an equally good chance that he is Ohio State's worst quarterback in the Ryan Day era, which would still be a great quarterback, but... Nonetheless, you don't want to downgrade from C.J. Stroud if you're Ohio State, whom your offense was built around. In comparison to Michigan, where their offense was built around Blake Corum, Donovan Edwards in the offensive line, and J.J. McCarthy was more of a supporting piece in a certain sense. The Buckeyes also, while signing a top-five recruiting class, and I think being one of the winners of the transfer portal, they only lost depth pieces— and they shored up the secondary, bringing in Jihad Carter, Davis and Igbenosan, and they got some experience on the offensive line and quarterback to help with leadership and depth. They have questions surrounding their coaching staff and defense. And speaking of surrounding coaching staff, they have questions surrounding their head coach because Ryan Day is under pressure. I wouldn't say hot seat pressure. Part of me would even decline to say competitive pressure because Gene Smith and the entire team threw their whole support behind him. But from the fan base, he's certainly under pressure. The article reads, Just how high are expectations for Ohio State on a yearly basis? One loss can ruin a season, especially if that loss is to Michigan. Ryan Day is feeling the heat after two straight losses to the Wolverines. While many were hoping that Day could channel the energy Jim Tressel and Urban Meyer had against that team up north, you mean Michigan, thank you. Lately, Day is coaching more like John Cooper against Ohio State's biggest rival. Day recovered from the most recent loss against Michigan to push Georgia to the limit in the Peach Bowl before a puzzling decision at the end of the game allowed the Bulldogs to survive and move on to the college football playoff national championship game. Under Day, Ohio State has made the college football playoff three times, but has failed to win the title in those appearances, only making the championship game once. In they did that via a routing of Clemson. There's no question Ohio State has the talent to make another college football playoff appearance this season, especially with some of the skill position players that are returning on offense. What is unknown is can the defense make strides in Jim Knowles' second season, and can Day handle giving up some of the play calling on offense? If Day and the rest of the coaching staff can't fix those issues and halt a two-game losing streak against Michigan and don't make the college football playoff, then it's going to be an even longer offseason in 2024. In Day's defense, college football has changed so much from when he took over as the head coach in Columbus. And since then, not only has there been an introduction of the transfer portal, NIL is also a huge part of recruiting too. Day and his coaching staff have to recruit high school prospects, 
figure out NIL packages, and keep current players happy to try and keep them out of the portal, all while evaluating those in the portal to, like what they did with Carter and Igbenos, and bring them in to fill in holes in case holes pop up from departures for the NFL, graduation, or the portal. With all of his responsibilities on and off the field, it'd be hard to blame Day if the NFL came calling and he decided to return to the professional ranks. He already has an idea of what is asked of NFL coaches since he spent time with the Eagles and 49ers. Even though the transition from college to the NFL has been tough for a lot of coaches that have made the jump, Day has some previous experience in the ranks. He's a young mind, genius offensive mind. When Day was acting head coach during Urban Meyer's suspension in 2018, and when he took over full-time at the end of the season, we saw a loose head coach that wasn't scared to mix it up on offense. Over time, it feels like Day is sometimes trying to fit a square peg into a round hole with some of his play calls. Like Ohio State, for example, this is me interjecting, but them forcing the run last year when it clearly wasn't working. There was no reason, for example, for C.J. Stroud to throw 26 times in what was essentially a hurricane in the Northwestern game. We saw the same things with Urban Meyer in his coaching career at Florida, for example, toward the end of Ohio State with the Iowa and Purdue losses. But this will be the fifth season. Day is the head coach in Columbus, and the writer of this article says that he doesn't see another five years in the cards for him. There's too much pressure for him to stick around that long. It's interesting, interesting that he writes this, and there's a little more. But I think that article is just enough to get, you know, a feel and a taste for what this guy's trying to say. And the guy's name who wrote the article, by the way, is Brett Ludwizak. So, yeah, article's linked down below. But I don't think that Day A is the kind of coach to run away from pressure. Maybe I'm wrong, but more importantly, like, really, really More importantly, what Ryan Day is facing in Michigan, Jim Tressel and, frankly, Urban Meyer never, never faced teams like that. You can maybe accept Jim Tressel from that if you look at Michigan's 2006 team, maybe their 2003 team when they were super hot by year's end after having some early losses. But Urban Meyer faced... Brady Hoke, and faced, I mean, he faced Jim Harbaugh pre-2020. And Jim Harbaugh pre-2020 was a coach who was trying to fit a round hole into a square peg. That was literally Jim Harbaugh before 2020. The 2016 team was great, but even they showed signs of stubbornness in play calling and mental weakness as a team as a whole. Ryan Day has faced the 2021 and 2022 Michigan squads, which, in my opinion, are the best teams Michigan has had in the 21st century. Best teams. Not most talented, but the best teams. The most talented teams, I'd say, would be 2022, 2016, and 2006. And maybe some of the Rich Rod teams with just how talented they were on offense and the coaching staff wrecked them on defense. But what Ryan Day is facing in Michigan is intense, and it's hard, and it doesn't excuse him being 1-2 and against the Wolverines. However, I don't think that exactly means that Ohio State is in the state of decline, and I don't exactly think that this means that Ryan Day has peaked as a head coach. Ryan Day certainly has a learning curve if he wants to beat Michigan, and believe me, he will at some point need to beat Michigan, because if he just will, the expectations are too high. This isn't even the John Cooper era anymore, where it took John Cooper going six and six and eight and four to get him canned. If Ryan Day were to go 10 and three after having a long losing streak to Michigan, I could see where he would get pressured out or bought out. I could just see it. The expectations for Ohio State are at the level of Alabama. They are, because Ohio State has been the most consistent program in winning percentage terms since the end of World War II. It really is crazy how Ohio State, how good Ohio State has been. And they are this year, as they were last year and the year before, and every year, every 
year. Since 2000, since 2013, when the, the sanctions were lifted, every year they've been a national title contender. Preseason, regular season, you name it. They're a national title contender. They have that potential. And the reasons for this are plenty, but here's just three of them. Ohio State returns all their contributing wide receivers from the 2022 season, most notably Marvin Harrison Jr. and Emeka Egbuka, who both had over 1,000 yards receiving. Marvin Harrison Jr. was a unanimous All-American at the position. Travion Henderson and Mayan Williams combined for 20 touchdowns last year while struggling with injuries. Imagine how much damage they can do if they are completely healthy. And don't forget Dallin Hayden, T.C. Caffey, Evan Pryor. They have a loaded backfield. They have a loaded running back room. If they're healthy there, Ohio State could have one of the best and potentially the best run game. I'd say interior run game in the country. Michigan's offensive line, especially at tackles, I think Michigan... I think Michigan would edge Ohio State at stretch runs. I think Michigan has the best run game overall, but Ohio State can compete with them. And it's really fascinating to me that I think the game this year will contain some of the best rushing offenses in the country, some of the best running back rooms. I think Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, in that order, have the three best running back rooms in the country. Michigan 1, Ohio State 2, Penn State 3 all of them with the potential to be number one. And Ohio State was banged up at the position last year, but we know that Henderson's a five-star, top-end speed. Mayan Williams is, in my opinion, a do-it-all back. He can catch the ball well. He has great speed, great acceleration, but he also has a power element to him that I really like. And finally, Ohio State's defense will be elite in year two because of returning production and Jim Knowles' adaptations. Jim Knowles is moving to more of a true 4-2-5 instead of a 4-2-5-3-3-5 hybrid where that fourth defensive lineman can play linebacker. The defense is beefing up. He's adapting his defense from what was really a Big 12 defense in year one to now what I think is going to be a legitimate Big 10 defense in year two of his scheme. Ohio State being ranked outside of the top five, to a certain degree, I get it, but it's not just ESPN. People all over the place are dropping Ohio State down. And to me, what's concerning about that, and it's not concerning really to me, it's just concerning for the fact if you're facing Ohio State, we all know what happens when these programs who recruit elite, who play elite, when they can muster that underdog potential. Kirby Smart did it last year while remaining undefeated. I don't know how he did it. Nick Saban has done it for years. Now, I don't know if in in the past few years, it seems like that hasn't been the case, but he's the GOAT, so I'm not going to doubt him there. Ohio State, for the first time in a while, is truly being doubted and looked down upon. And it's different than Alabama. I mean, Alabama had to bring in Tyler Buckner, who's probably going to be their starting quarterback. They have legitimate, terrifying vulnerability to, at a position. They're also outside of the top 120 in returning production. Meanwhile, Ohio State's top 50 in returning production. This team's a national title contender. This team is right up there with Georgia, right up there with Michigan. I'd argue right now they're actually ahead of Alabama by a decent amount. And I think that having them outside of the top five is asking them to prove you wrong. That's what I think. That's what I think of Ohio State right now. They return seven offensive starters, five defensive starters. They bring in Carter and Igbenosin. Their special teams are going to be good. I, I really like Ohio State this year. I really do. And I'm making this video just because... I think there's more overwhelming evidence that this team is going to be elite than there isn't. I mean, if this team goes 11-1 and and loses to Michigan again, the likelihood that they make the college football playoff at 11-1 and losing to Michigan is more likely than not. 
especially given the fact that they have a road game against Notre Dame. They play Penn State and Wisconsin, who should both be top 15. Likely both of them will be top 10 teams. I know Penn State certainly will, and I'm very high in Wisconsin. But Ohio State, if they do reach the playoff, as we saw last year, they can win it all. They can win it all. So I don't think Ryan Day is peaked as a head coach. Now, that the jury will be out on that for this year and beyond. It'll take potentially years to see if that's the case. But I think this team is an elite team, and I can't wait to see him play, along with Penn State, along with Michigan, along with reigning two-time national champion Georgia. I'm fascinated to see how Ohio State overcomes its tackle adversity, in the same way that I am to see how Alabama overcomes its quarterback adversity. So we're entering phase two of the college football preseason. And if you're an Ohio State fan, or if you're a college football playoff, not college football playoff, I meant college football fan, I'd encourage you to just to remind yourself that this Ohio State team is not going anywhere. And if you really do the research... I think you'll agree with me, and I think you'll disagree with ESPN. But I just wanted to talk about that today, and I'll be doing this for some other teams as well. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to click the like button, hit the subscribe button, and hit the notification bell. My top 25 will be releasing later this week. My Big Ten predictions post-spring edition. That video will either be released later this week as well, potentially early next week. I'll keep you guys updated on that. Thank you for watching, and if you're listening via Spotify, please follow the channel. Thank you guys so much.